So welcome everyone to today's webinar, Talk Soon, Talk Often. Uh, you may be familiar with the webinar. Uh, today we're doing it a little bit differently. As you can see, um, Naomi and, and myself um, from the HARP team from Kardashian Project are in two different locations today. Usually when we do a webinar, we are in the same place and um, this one's going to be a bit different to, uh, uh, to what we're used to. So bear with us. We want to make sure that um, all of your questions are answered from the chat box, um, but we will, you know, take take it easy. Let's, you know, go go through this content in a bit of a different way, in a bit more of a Q and A style. Uh, but as we as we start today's webinar, I'm going to navigate over here to um, acknowledge country. So I would like to, or we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet, live and work. For myself, where I'm sitting today, it's the Wadi Wadi people of the Darawal Nation. And we've encouraged you to um, acknowledge the country that you're sitting at today in the chat box. So I really wanna um, extend that acknowledgement there as well. We recognize their powerful connection to land, waterways and sea and to community. We would like to pay our deepest respects to the elders past and present and emerging to families, communities and survivors and to those who never made it home. As we share in our own knowledge, learnings and our teaching in this space today, may we also recognise the knowledge uh, and pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within Aboriginal custodianship of country. So thank you so much for um, adding your acknowledgement to the chat box. Uh, I will... Um, oh. As a, as a co-host, Naomi, would you like to just acknowledge where you're sitting at today? Sorry, I skipped over yeah, that. Yeah, you guys can see it in my um, title there. I'm sitting on yeah. beautiful UN country down in Nara today. I proudly live and work in UN country. So thank you for that, Maddie. And I think another important acknowledgement for us today, as Joseph has brought up in the chat box, mm -hmm. is it is Are You OK Day? Yes. So it's nice to be beaming into you on Are You OK Day when we know that um, there's a lot of people out there who are perhaps not as okay as they could be or would mm. be during the current times that we face. So please, we're all here to support you. And I'm sure that you have lots of loved ones around you that are willing to support you too. So it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay not to speak out and to um, seek help. So mm. big hugs, big hugs and love and good vibes to everyone out there today. Virtual, virtual hugs. <laughs> we're all in different places, aren't we? It's really weird, but here we are. Um, so, yeah, I think kind of leading off that, Gnomes, um, we can confident, confidently say today that we're all wearing multiple hats. I think saying that we're wearing two hats is um, probably very conservative. We've probably got lots of different hats that we're wearing today. We've got our work hats on. We've got our um, family hats on, our friends and also community members and, and probably many other roles that you play. Um, as well. So we have our own experiences to reflect and draw upon and experiences of others that are close to us. And so I think to start us off in today's session, um, we really want to know why you signed up for today's session. What What is your um, expectation uh, for today's session? And to do that, we're going to trial a new um, kind of engaging uh, activity here and we'd actually like to put put that out to you so hopefully now you can see our whiteboard screen you can see uh, that whiteboard so if you all go up into the top of that zoom meeting bar next to where it says you're viewing the Caddyshack project screen you can see a view options if you click on that view options uh, right click and just go down to annotate once you click on annotate, you will now be able to write into that whiteboard option yourself. Your responses are kept anonymous. Other people on the chat can't see who's written what. So please oh. feel free. Oh, it has come I up as we, a joke. Oh, we, maybe yeah, we can. I think we can. Let's go. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's a safe could. place. You know, we're all, we're all in here together. If you feel um, particularly uncomfortable about that, you can always change your name <laughs> in um, your participant list. But um let's just give it a go uh it is the first time that we're using um sorry jennifer i'll get to you in a minute this is the first yeah. time we're using whiteboard so we we want to utilize it throughout today's session and it's going to be a little bit different to other um talk soon talk often webinars that we've done in the past so um have a bit of a play and let us know why you've signed up 
for today's session. Jennifer, did you have a question? I, I did because yeah. I just did. Sorry, I was doing That's something okay. else and I wasn't li full on listening to you, Naomi, how to get into it. So sorry. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so if you go up into next to the green part at the top of that um, screen, you can see where it says view options. Right click on view options and then, sorry, it's left click on view options and then scroll down to annotate. Once you're in annotate, it comes up as a pencil, but you go back up to that top um, bar and there should be a text option. Click the text option, click on the screen, and then you can let us know why it is that you're in today. So I've just put a first example in there that hopefully everybody can see. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks, Joseph. So today's, <laughs> today's webinar um, will be a little bit different to what we've done in the past. It will be more of that Q&A style. Um, and we've got a whole bunch of commonly asked questions that um, has come up over the Talk Soon, Talk Often webinars that we've done in the past, and we're going to address those. So um, it would be great to, to see why you signed up to today, and, and we'll also check back in with those expectations at the end of the session to make sure that we've covered um, what your expectations were, and if we haven't, we can point you in the right direction. If you like can just, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, when you when you drop it, yeah, perfect. Thanks, guys. I was going to say, when you drop it, sometimes it covers somebody else's comment. But if we can just. That's right. It. It's just me moving them around. <laughs> um, some great um, comments in there. I love curiosity. Definitely. Yeah. I'll give Lots you a moment. improving to... practice and knowledge, which, yeah, we're definitely aiming to do today. So it's good that you're here for that. Yeah. Highly recommended. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> <Big on shoot. laughs> I've okay. been doing it a while now. It'll be right. <laughs> yeah. I'm just moving some of them around so that we can see them. Um, that looks great. So if everyone's had an opportunity to do that, I will um, go back to our presentation. And you can see that, can't you, Gnomes? Yeah. Practice makes perfect. There we go. <laughs> it does. You just might want to jump to the next slide for me now. Yeah. All good. Wonderful. So as Maddie said, thank you so much for being on this morning. And um, we really appreciate people taking the time to join us. It was really good to see the reasons why you have signed up. And I know that many of us are on here with multiple hats, as Maddie has said. So. Today is labelled Fulf and Wanger. Um, they were two terms that we came up with last year in terms of promoting this training. We do call it our Talk Soon, Talk Often training, and it is an opportunity for us to talk you through this fantastic resource, some of the hot topics that come up in that resource, what the resource is really aiming to achieve, and some tips and strategies that you can use yourself for when you're talking with young people who you're working with. So, I'll just introduce you briefly to the research, uh, sorry, to the resource, um, and we'll talk about it a bit more after our next little section, but just so that you're familiar with the resource. This is the New South Wales adapted version. We do have copies of this. Some of you elected to have copies sent out to you when you registered for the training. Mm -hmm. It is also available online as a digital link. If you're now wishing that you did get a copy of the resource, because it is such a wonderful tool to have, you can still email us. We just got a new delivery of these in yesterday. So if you would like a hard copy of the resource, please don't hesitate to email Jen and we'll make sure we get one of those sent out to you. Just while I'm talking on that, the other two accompanying resources that go with this, there is a downloadable fact sheet from the webpage that will come through in a follow-up link mm -hmm. to you. This is really just um, a couple of those key strong take-home messages throughout the resource. So it is a good one to have on hand to be able to provide to parents and carers if you're working with them or just a really quick almost cheat sheet to have for yourself in thinking about those conversations that we're having with young people. Can we please provide, please provide Jen's email address? She'll drop that one into the chat box for yeah. you, Joe. 
The other thing is this um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adapted version of the resource called Yarn in Quiet Ways. It is from Western Australia. We haven't had an Aboriginal adaptation in New South Wales yet, unfortunately, but still a fantastic resource. And just to let you know that this is available through the WA government um, health resources page, you can order copies of this resource and we will drop the link to the uh, resource ordering um, platform in the follow-up email that you get. So just introducing you to the suite of tools and resources that we'll be discussing today. Thanks, Mads. So I guess just a little bit of a um, warning for those of you who may have children in the room. I know that some of us are working from home and you may have me on loudspeaker and there may be little ears in the room. Um, I suggest you either put some headphones in for this little section or perhaps just mute um, me so you can't hear me or turn the volume down until you see the next slide come up. I don't want to be responsible for destroying any dreams out there. So <laughs> just a full disclosure. I'll give you a moment. Okay, so before you think, hmm, Naomi's gone a little bit off topic, what does the tooth fairy have anything to do with today's session? I want you to just bear with me. So let's have a tale of the tooth fairy. All of us have lost teeth at some point of our lives. For some, this was a rite of passage, so to speak. For others, we may recall a trauma associated with teeth removal. For me, it is literally the stuff of nightmares. I have ongoing reoccurring dreams about my teeth crumbling and falling out. Some of us may have young people in their lives going through the tooth losing process. I am one of these. My sons are losing their teeth at the moment, one by nature, the other one emergency dental appointment at a time. The natural guy, he comes running in. Hey, mum, I have a wobbly tooth. I instantly get goosebumps. A chill goes through me. Even now, just talking about it, I want to cringe. I find it tough to talk about. I find it even harder to watch. That wiggling when they get the tooth behind, ooh, the tongue behind the tooth. I endure it though, because I have to. It's a part of their life and it's a part of their development. And as their primary carer, it's up to me to help them guide them through this process and to make this time in their life one that's a smoother transition. We talk about the tooth wobbling, what it will feel like when it falls out, that funny feeling you get when you constantly poke your tongue through the gap once it's come out. We talk about how to manage the blood when the tooth has come out, how we care for the gum, and how we brush the new tooth that's coming through. I didn't scuttle them off into the bathroom and whisper, you're going to lose a tooth, but we don't talk about this. Don't talk about this with your friends at school. When that tooth's fallen out, can you just pop it in the drawer over there? We'll deal with that later. I didn't talk like that about the tooth. In fact, I had a really open, honest conversation with them about what to expect. And then indeed, when the tooth did come out, we celebrated. And a thing called the tooth fairy came and took that tooth away and left a gold coin. Now, I want you to imagine for just a moment if this was sex. If talking about sex and relationships with our children and young people were the same, that we informed our young people on how to prepare, that we talked to them about how it might feel, not just physically, but also emotionally, that we celebrated the safe choices that the young people were making and that we were there offering love and support no matter how difficult or awkward it was for us to handle, just the same way that we did when it came to them losing their teeth. Think about it. Why should a conversation around sexual health and relationships be any different to the other conversations that we're having with our young people about health and well-being? It's all intertwined. We need to think about our young people's health holistically. The more openly and honestly we talk with them, the more trust and rapport we build. We talk to them about the little stuff when they're little so that they will come and talk to us about the big stuff when they're big. P.S. For the saddest that are amongst us, I've kept all the teeth. I can't bear to get rid of those pieces of my babies. 
There is a method in my madness, however. One day, when the tooth fairy is no longer believable, I'll return those teeth to said owners and I'll ask for my money back. P.S. Oh. Santa Claus does really exist. He just has lots of helpers. <laughs> I love that. That is brilliant. Oh, someone in the chat box has said they have a copy of the blue one, not the yellow book. Um, there is a reason for that, and I'll discuss that in a moment. So I have just seen that pop oh. up. So there you go. That's just a nice little introduction to set the scene into what we're about to delve into in terms of how we start those conversations with our young mm. people about sexual health and relationships and the fact that it doesn't have to be as scary and daunting as some of us may think mm. it may be. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. It's a really good analogy, actually, that that tooth fairy one and a really great way to to kickstart the conversation and, and get us thinking about what we're talking about and why we're talking about what we're talking about. So um, as you can see, the resource is called Talk Soon, Talk Often, T-S-T-O. Um, but what does that actually mean? You know, like what, what does Talk Soon, Talk Often actually mean? Why is it important and how do we do it? And so... I'm going to hand back over to you, Gnomes, because um, this this talk soon talk often really is one of your babies. So <laughs> I feel like you can you can really let us know um, why why do we why should we talk soon talk often? Sure. So what is this resource? Now the reason why you guys have the bluish green copy and not the yellow one. This is a resource that was initially designed and developed in Western Australia by the Western Australia Department of Health. We made an adaptation with their permission to make it relevant to New South Wales. So that's the copy that you have. The yellow version that was shown up on the screen just before, Western Australia in the last 12 months have updated their version of the resource and that's the new cover. So I popped that one up there just in case you're trying to order some copies online. It is essentially the same resource with very similar information. They've just done a little bit of update as they like to do with resources. So what is the resource? Western Australia government put in a lot of time and effort into the development of this resource. And they consulted with parents and carers quite heavily around what it was exactly that they wanted to be able to help start these conversations with their young people. What parents and carers reported was wanting to know what to expect and at what stage. So simply put, what behaviours and actions are age appropriate? What should I be preparing myself for? One of the things that I love most about Talk Soon, Talk Often is that it is breaking down into age groups. So depending on the age of the young person who you're caring for or working with, you can flip to the relevant section and find out some really useful practical information that's age appropriate and related to them. This information goes from birth right up to the early 20s and starts from page 13, or sorry, page 12 to 13 in the resource. So it goes through those separate ages. What parents wanted or carers wanted was a reliable source of information that was hard wearing. So it is actually a really high quality resource. It's not just a simple flimsy paper brochure. So they wanted something that they could essentially keep almost like, you know, the book on how to have those conversations with young people. It was a chance for parents and carers to be able to share the values that they themselves had around sexual health and relationships with the young people who they were working with or raising and it was a tool to be able to open that communication but also to keep it going and that's what we're really hoping that you can take out of today is how to start those conversations but not only just starting them how to keep them relevant and how to keep them reoccurring it was about having that information to sexual health and relationships and knowing how to deal with that sexual information appropriately the why of the resource is that predominantly parents and carers are the primary sexuality educators in young people's lives. We know that young people will often turn to their peers or to the internet to get this information. But when surveyed or questioned themselves, young people were still saying that they wanted to get that information from a trusted, respected adult, which in most cases was their primary carer, being it a parent or a carer. As parents or carers or somebody who has a significant role in a young person's life, 
we as adults are best placed to teach them attitudes and values towards sexuality and to help them shape that journey and to make it as safe as possible. It really does take a family and a community to raise a child. So if it isn't um, a biological parent, it is somebody who is a trusted, respected adult in that young person's life, a carer, a youth worker, a teacher, an older family member. You can see all the different hats and roles that we all can play. Sexuality does start with the family and indeed it is where a lot of it does happen. I know that there are a lot of parents and carers out there who may find the conversations a little bit difficult to have, a little bit difficult to initiate and start. That's why today's training is developed to help you um, feel like you're better equipped to start and have those conversations with young people. And to remember that while sexuality education is included in the curriculum, it's not the responsibility of schools or educational facilities to be having these conversations. It's the responsibility of those trusted and respected people within that young person's life, typically within the family unit. So we really want you to be thinking about discussing these topics around sexual health and relationships in a more open, honest, casual, yet informed way with the young people who you have within your life. The how of the resource is what today is all about. Today's session introduces you to the resource, but we're also going to equip you with lots of tools and strategies that you can take moving forward to start these conversations. As Maddie said before, we're more than happy to take any questions that you have. Feel free to drop them into the chat box. Even after the session, if something comes up for you, you have our email contact details. Please don't hesitate to get in touch. What we're going to do now is to, I guess, break down a little bit of the title, Foof and Wang. Um, I know that we all have lots of pet names um, for genitals. So we're going to move back to the whiteboard and we're just going to hash it all out. Let's just drop in there, no holes barred, all the slang terms that we have heard for genitals. So be it our breasts, our bottoms, our penises or vaginas. What are the slang terms that you've heard or that you use for genitals? Remembering if you go to view options up the top, you click, go down to annotate. And then when you get your text box, oh, sorry, when you get the box at the top, click on text, and then you can start typing into that whiteboard for us. Off you go. Oh, lots coming through, which is great. I can see. <laughs> People trying to, to navigate. I can see a few people using um, the, like making lots of little dots. If you click on, I think you're on draw, so you need to click on text. There you yeah, go. Just but go up into that top box and click text. It was, it was worth it with tits, so. <laughs> Come on, guys, I'm doing a lot of typing. Where's my friends helping me out? <laughs> oh, banana, eggplant, peach, yes. Thank goodness for emojis, hey? <laughs> yeah. And we haven't even got into it. The thing is with whiteboard is we're quite, Naomi and I are quite new at playing around with whiteboard. You can actually put in emojis and stamps, but we thought let's just make it simple <laughs> and just and just get the words and not go into the emojis because that's a whole nother no a whole nother slang term for genitals, isn't it? It sure is. Mm. Lots oh, coming so through nice. private parts, yeah. Awesome. I'll give you a few more seconds on that. Get your creative genius down there. Lots of pussies. Yeah. Could even start to maybe group a few of them that are similar together. So, Joe, I can just see um, you've commented in the chat box, how do you type something? If you go right up to the top bar where next to the green highlighted section, there is a view options. If you'd like to click on view options and you scroll down to annotate, click on annotate and that will bring up a pencil for you. If you now go back up into that top bar, you'll see a T and text. 
if you click on that and then click onto the screen, it will let you right into there. Flower, yeah, yeah, very much in line with fairy. Mm. Excellent. I'll start to talk to some of this while you continue writing in there. So the training was titled Foof and Wanger. Foof being a, um, a slang term for a vagina, wanger being a slang term for a penis. We know that lots of families and individuals have their own pet names or slang terms that they refer to genitals as we strongly encourage the correct use of anatomical terms from birth. That is, it is a penis, it is a vagina, they are breasts, and it is a bottom. It can be really nice and often funny to have these slang terms for genitals. And I love it when I do this activity with young people because some of the things that come up with is just hilarious and it actually helps just to get all the giggles out. And it's like, oh, she yeah. said vagina, she said penis, um, which, you know, it's quite funny to them when they hear an adult talk like that. But um, I remember my sister having had my nephew we were driving up to see him and my children were four and two at the time. And my four-year-old said, did the baby come out of um, Aunty Jess's vagina? And I said, yes, it did. Well, my husband's nearly swerved the car off the road and crashed it because our son had known that a baby came out of vagina and he said the word vagina. My children were always asking me, mummy, do you have a penis? And me trying to explain to them, no, mummy doesn't have a penis, mummy has a vagina. But ensuring that we're using those correct anatomical terms. Why it is important is if, and hopefully not, but it, it does happen, in the unfortunate event that a young person has experienced an incident of unwanted sexual contact or sexual assault, it is really important for them to be able to use correct anatomical terms. Police get a little bit confused when they say, he touched my hamburger, or he touched my flower, or he touched my pee pee. It doesn't necessarily make sense to them. And we also need to be role modeling that language as appropriate. It's not rude to say penis or vagina. It is an accurate, correct anatomical term. So we need to be modeling that and using that from birth. There is a really big movement. I know even towards um, parents and carers changing children's nappy when we go on in a minute to talk about consent, to be saying to that young person, I'm about, you know, mummy or daddy or carer, whoever is about to change your nappy. I'm going to touch your penis. I'm going to touch your vagina. This is okay. You're safe. Whatever that language might be. And we're really role modeling that from birth. And I think that that's something that's really important. Mm. I'm loving all the love hearts. Somebody's found the stamp, the yeah. stamp option. I was, I was waiting for it. <laughs> so we do this activity um, like I said it's really fun to do with young people it kind of helps to set the scene and it gets rid of some of that nervous tension that might be there at the beginning of a session but it just goes to show that there are so many names and so many references out there um, my six-year-old son came dancing out of the shower the other night having a wow of a time and he's like I've got a Wonga Willy and I'm like yeah. what are you talking about and uh, Wonga Willy is a, a council town or suburb near us and there's lots of ads on the TV about Wonga Willy and he just he said he had a willy and it was a Wonga Willy. So there you go. Thought I had a new bird species in the house. <laughs> <laughs> but he does know that that's his penis. He was being quite funny. All right. Thank you for that contribution. That's great. Some new ones there. Yeah. I like it go back into our slides and I think the, the big thing really that I always take away when I hear you talk about that gnomes is around it's just another body part yeah. you know we, we don't screw up our nose and say oh that's really rude when you're talking about your you know arm or your foot or you know like it's just another body part that it's just so ingrained in us to see that that being a pen saying the word penis is rude so yeah I think that's always something I get away from from hearing you talk about that, Gnomes. Absolutely. 
Excellent. So one of the questions that we get asked is how soon is too soon? When should we be starting to have these conversations with the young people in our lives? And what I will say is you are the expert or you are the key person in that young person's life. So there's really no short answer to this question. There's just a few tips and pieces of advice that we can offer. So the first is that it's really important to have an understanding for yourself about that young person's development, the stage of development and what it is that they may be going through. Um, that's where the resource can really help you in terms of the ages and what it is that they might be going through, what they might be experiencing, some of those signs of puberty and development that you might start noticing in terms of breast development, pubic hair, that kind of thing. So really think about what information is going to be appropriate to their level of development. The other thing I say is it's time to start the conversation when they start to ask questions. Young people might start coming to us with questions and don't underestimate what it is that they already know. We may not yet have had a conversation with them about it, but rest assured they've heard conversations either through um, TV shows, movies, even down to things like songs, but also hearing conversations from peers in the playground, particularly true if their peers have older siblings. So their peer ages may be advanced in their years in terms of what they know, depending on what their own family units and structures look like. As I mentioned, it is important from birth to be talking about those anatomical terms. It's never too soon to start that. And I also don't believe it's ever too soon to start a conversation or to start role modelling both self-esteem and healthy relationships. We will touch on those in a moment as those fundamental building blocks of sexual health. Role modelling is so important. That's what you can best be doing for the child or young person in your life is to role model that behaviour, role model what healthy self-esteem looks like, role model what healthy relationships look like. We are their mirror in a lot of ways. Having these discussions also helps to establish boundaries. And that's really important when we come to talking about things around sex positivity and consent, which are other hot topics that we bring up later in this session as well. Starting those conversations, being able to talk to that young person, letting them have some sense of freedom and feeling to express, to explore and develop when it comes to this. We want to go on to where do we start, man? So other than when do we start the conversation, a lot of people are like, where or how do I start that conversation? One of the first things that I recommend you do is that if you know it's coming up to um, an appropriate time to start these conversations with the young person in your life, is to really check in on your own knowledge and think, where am I currently at? with being prepared to answer some of these questions that they might have. We will send out a list of um, resources that you can access to help you get up to date with current knowledge around sexual health and relationships as a follow-up to this session today as well. To me, it's really important to be present with that young person, to be with them where they are in the here and the now, I think a lot of the time these days we can get caught up and so distracted by other things that are happening around us, but it's really important to show that young person that we are in the here and now with them and we are listening to them. They have our full attention. That's why I say that being in the car with a young person is a really good chance to have that conversation. First of all, you're not face to face, you're side to side, and that can make the conversation a lot less confronting. It also often means that you have at least a sort of 10 to 15 minute window to be able to start or have a piece of a conversation with the young person. And it's unlikely that they're going to open the door and jump out to get out of the conversation. Other things like going on a bushwalk or walking along the beach, something where you're able to connect, but not necessarily be face to face, where it can be quite daunting and challenging for both parties. What I want to say first and foremost is it's not just about starting the conversation. I think a lot of people out there may start the conversation or they've had a conversation with a young person and they're like, yep, done, excellent. I've had that conversation. I can move on now. I've done my job. 
when it comes to talking about all these big life matters for young people, it's not just a one-off conversation. These are conversations that are ongoing. We pick them up at different points in time, depending on what it is that that young person is going through. One of the best strategies to help start the conversation is to use things that the young person is engaged in and has a reference point to. Things like movies, TV shows, or even song lyrics and music that they're listening to. If a scenario plays out, and this is where Home and Away used to always be good because Home and Away used to cover all the big issues in life, being able to check in with them and say, what did you think about what that character went through? Have you had a friend in a similar situation to that? How would you handle that situation or how would you work through that if yourself or a friend were put into that position? It really just helps to break the ice and to start getting them to engage in those conversations. So think about those reference points that you can use. Another thing is to what we say globalise or normalise. So saying something to your young person like, you know, Oh, a lot of people your age might start to date or they might start to be in relationships. I'm here if you would ever like to come and ask any questions about that. Or some people become sexually active when they enter into a relationship. I know you've been in a relationship for a while now. So if that's something that you're thinking of or something that you're partaking in, let's have a conversation about contraception and protection and the importance of sexual health screening. They don't have to be really in-depth, long, difficult conversations. It's really just starting and taking what I call teachable moments to have those conversations with our young people. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Gnomes. Uh, you kind of already started um, mentioning those fundamentals or those building blocks of sexual health. I've heard you um, mention sexuality before and I feel like um, sexuality is such a, obviously such a huge fundamental to sexual health but I think there's sometimes some some uh, confusion about the word sexuality and it's and it only being to LGBTIQ plus community um, can you shed some light into you know how how we can all agree that sexuality is is part of all of us and and why it's such an important building block to sexual health Absolutely. So I think that for a while now, sexuality has very much been assigned with an identity or how yeah. it is that we feel and hence how the term has, I guess, um, been more associated with our LGBTIQA plus communities where, in fact, sexuality is something that we all have and that we all experience. We say that sexuality is a cradle to grave phenomenon. That means that from the moment we are born until the moment that we pass, we have sexual thoughts, feelings, desires, and behaviors. Someone may go through their life without ever having had a physical sexual experience, but even without that physicality, those emotions, those thoughts, and those feelings are all there. So sexuality really is about the fact that we are sexual beings we do have sexual needs and in fact positive sexual experiences are a right there's something that they, we are entitled to mm. I guess this is where we've seen it a lot in say fields for example people with a disability some people may be hesitant to educate people with a disability the same way that they would educate their peers however just because you haven't provided the education doesn't mean that they're not going to have the same thoughts, feelings and desires. So it is really important that we're being fair and equitable when providing sexual health education and that everybody has a right to sex and sexuality in a safe and positive way. Mm. And a really great point, Gnomes, I'll just jump in um, coming through the chat box around um, if you identify as asexual and, and never mm. having thought those thoughts around sex. And I think that's a really great point because you know that's okay yeah <laughs> you know, absolutely if you're not having those thoughts mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with you that's that's just that's yeah. that's your normal that's okay 
Yeah, and I bring that up a little bit later when we talk yeah. about reality versus perception as yes. well. So what what people um, have going on, and you're right, Maddie, that it it takes all sorts, and it's not about being different or abnormal. It's about mm. you, and that that's okay that you're having those mm. feelings, whatever they may be. But I think what we really need to take away from it is that sexuality is more than just a physical state mm. or a sense of being. Um, it is greater than just an identity, but we also need to keep in mind that sexuality when used in terms of that identity and how I may identify myself in terms of sex or gender or my preferred um, choice of partner that sexuality is fluid so it's not something that is um, a fixed entity it can change throughout somebody's lifetime as well so especially when we're talking about young people, they're experimenting, they're doing lots of different things, trying to figure out where they fit into the world. It's important to remind them that sexuality is not necessarily a fixed identity, that it can be rather fluid. Yeah, yeah great point. The, the next fundamental, which um, I'd like to move on to, is self-esteem. And, and it's a big one, isn't it, Gnomes? I think self-esteem is, is something that we all... Um, think about it at multiple points along our life and and what role does sexual does um self-esteem play in um sex and why is it so important it is a really big one and i think it's one of those ones that can be a little hard to tackle with young people sometimes yeah. because quite often they can find it really difficult to identify things that they like about themselves and we find ourselves particularly these days with social media a lot of young people being connected in ways that they wouldn't have been previously and therefore there's a lot more for them to compare themselves against. It was a really good reminder for anyone who watched Mirror Mirror last night that when we're tuning into social media, people are putting their best version of themselves forward. You then find yourself comparing essentially your worst version of self to their best mm -hmm. and their best version is 98% fake, i.e. it has been filtered or adjusted before being put online. So we need to be thinking about that. Mm. When it comes to self-esteem, why are we really working with young people to increase it? My favourite saying is that if we increase a young person's self-esteem and resilience, we're a long way to tackling the problem no matter what it be. So whether it be an issue around drug and alcohol, mental health or sexual health, through increasing their self-esteem, their sense of self-love, their sense of worth, and increasing resilience, we're well on track to getting them to be the best version of themselves. Self-esteem when it comes to sexual health and relationships is important because it helps us to set some of those boundaries. There's a sense of I need to love myself before I can expect anybody else to love me. And if I have higher self-esteem, I'm more likely to find myself in a healthy relationship because I know when to walk away. I don't need to be in a relationship to justify who it is that I am as a person. Higher self-esteem can often mean that those young people find themselves in less risky situations, which is obviously important when it comes to sexual health. We want them to be in safe, supported sexual situations wherever possible. It's also about knowing what it is that you want sexually and not being afraid to ask for it. And I think that's a really empowering thing for young people too. As I said, it can be difficult for them to identify things that they like about themselves. More often than not, they'll identify the things that they don't like. But this is where that role modelling becomes particularly important. As adults, we can and should be modelling positive self-esteem around our young people. So not looking into the mirror and saying the things that we don't like about ourselves. Being able to use positive self-talk in that environment is really important. Mm. Unfortunately, what happens when we see young people with low self-esteem, quite often it's that sense of peer pressure and that needing to fit in. I just want to give a really quick example of having worked with some young people in the past. These were young women and these were young women who were part of a young women's program and the idea was to work with them to build self-esteem. And one of the things that had come up was um, going to a party situation and performing oral sex on multiple males in attendance at the party. And in that performing of the oral sex, that young person's self-esteem was increased because 
they had that other person's attention for the five or 10 minutes that the act took. They had this sense of being wanted, being needed. But the flip side of that was that then when that act finished and they moved on to somebody else, their self-esteem then plummeted. So unfortunately, we see that if people have lower self-esteem, they might put themselves in riskier situations to try to boost that self-esteem. And it may work, but often it's only for a short period of time. And then the crash of that self-esteem on the other side of that becomes quite problematic. We will touch on this again when we talk about the hot topic of sexting in just a moment. So like I said, it's really trying to work with our young people, both males and females, to end um, intersex, different um, identities, to feel that value, to feel that you are worthy, that you are worthy and you deserve love and that that love first and foremost needs to come from self. Mm. Yeah, and I guess, you know, being being the adult that we may have been needing when we were, we, we've all been, we've all been a young person, haven't absolutely, we? Absolutely, absolutely. Some of us have been really fortunate to have those role models in our lives and some of us maybe needed, needed them. And so, you know, keeping, keeping that in mind in the bigger picture as well. And I think that leads us perfectly into talking about relationships and all different types of relationships mm-hmm. and you know how do we talk about different types of relationships connections and also boundaries I think that's that's the big one how do how do we talk about that absolutely and you've hit the nail on the head there Maddie when we think about relationships if we think about them as connections mm. they're those connections and interactions that we're having with other people a lot of people when they hear the term relationship just automatically jump to thinking about those romantic connections that we may have with somebody but in fact relationships are so much more than that we have relationships with family with friends with peers with colleagues it's so much more than just a romantic relationship but the characteristics of a healthy or unhealthy relationship are very similar across those connections. So when we think about young people, this is a time of experimentation. They are going into some of these connections with a much greater, um, I guess, sense of self and trying to figure out who they are, where they belong, who do they belong with. And we know that we don't always get it right the first time. It comes from having those connections, I guess, being let down in some cases and thinking, how do we build ourselves back up after we've had that experience? What we want is to help young people to build those boundaries in the sense of what do I feel safe with versus what am I not safe with? And I need to be able to make sure that I am in those healthy relationships and that if I do find myself unsafe, I have the confidence to be able to talk to somebody about that and hopefully to lead that relationship. So when we talk about healthy relationships, what does healthy look like? Often it's going to involve things like love, but really first and foremost, it comes down to respect, respect within that relationship or that connection, no matter what it is. I think that communication and so and support is particularly important in relationships and connections. And then when we think about the things that are unhealthy, we're thinking about abuse. And it's not just physical abuse that a lot of people think about, but it's also financial abuse, emotional abuse, and sadly at times it might be sexual abuse. It can be those put-downs, that controlling behaviour, that sense of jealousy and being really restricted and controlling or isolating who it is that they may or may not be letting you associate with. Again, it's where role modelling comes into play. I think it's particularly important for us as adults or having that senior role within that young person's life to be modelling really um, healthy relationships or what to do if that relationship is no longer healthy. Um, Like I said, we're generally learning from experience and so young people need time and space to work through this. I think as the the, um, sort of more mature person in a relationship, it's okay for us to look at it and see some of those red flags or warning signs in the relationship, but it can be really difficult for us to have that conversation with the young person. This is where we encourage peers to talk to their friends about relationships. They can best see how it is that that relationship has changed their friend, either for better or for worse potentially, and they can be a bit of a sounder. It is tricky because of self-esteem and it is tricky between not wanting to rock the boat too much between friendships and connections. 
But I think if you're able to have those conversations with your young people and get them to encourage their peers around relationships and to speak openly when they've noticed a change, their friend will hopefully be all the better for it once they've been able to leave that relationship. Unfortunately, when we're in those relationships, we're really close to the situation. So it can be hard for us to see some of those red flags sometimes for ourselves. And particularly when it comes to self-esteem and I don't know how true it is at the moment, but I know that in years gone past, there's been a real sense of like status around being in a relationship. So therefore, young people have found themselves in relationships that weren't necessarily ideal and that potentially they knew were unhealthy or were wanting to get out of, but they stayed in them because it was cool to be in a relationship. So again, if we can increase self-esteem, we've increased that sense of I'm okay by myself. I don't need somebody else to be with me to qualify who it is that I am as a person. Yeah. So having those conversations, role modeling what a healthy relationship looks like, what to do if you find yourself in an unhealthy relationship and thinking about how you can get yourself out of that and being really open and honest with peers and friends about what you're seeing for that relationship and particularly important at the moment um wouldn't you agree when we're not we're not physically connected to our to our friends and and to those relationships that we have and and we are feeling a little bit isolated and a little bit alone and then that's where that self-esteem that healthy positive self-esteem is really important so that we don't feel like we're we're reaching out to those unhealthy relationships to fill that void Absolutely. I think all yeah. of us could agree that we're probably in a very unhealthy relationship with the government right now. <laughs> Let's move on. Yes. <laughs> this is just a little bit of a breakup. Young people need role models, not critics. So a lot of people say that young people are our best natural resource. Let's role model to them. Let's not criticise them. Um, unfortunately, young people get a lot of bad press, but I can tell you that for every bad news story, there's 10 good news stories out there about young people. We're just sadly not hearing them. So, yeah, tune in with those young people and look for all the great things that are happening because they really are our best natural resource. So I want to take a moment are you all to have a think about when you were growing up and what your memory was of having the talk or the sexual health relationship discussion with your significant person have a think about who it was with where you were at was it a one-off conversation was it a conversation that occurred over time think about what was good about the way that conversation unfolded, maybe what was not so good that you wish was a little bit different. And thinking about your experience, how you could use your experience to change it or make it a little bit different and therefore hopefully better or more educating for a young person in your life. So feel free to drop some... <laughs> Oh, Joseph, you make me laugh. Does anyone remember the VHS tape? Where do I come from? I have never seen an egg and sperm dance so delightfully in my <laughs> life, dressed up in a little tuxedo and ballet skirt. How could I forget it? Anyone that's not from the 80s or early 90s, you may just be like, what are they talking about? But, um, I, I sure do remember it, mate. I sure do. <laughs> Forever ingrained. I actually have the book at home. I should send it to you one day for a laugh. Um, so drop in the chat box what your experience was like if you feel like sharing that, just particularly who it was with and how that conversation kind of unfolded. I'll give you a moment to drop some examples into that chat box for us and then we'll move forward. I think I remember being a, being a big sister as well when my, my little sisters went to school and had the talk at the school and then they came home and walked upstairs from the garage and just shot dad, my dad a look and was like, gross <laughs> and then just stormed off to their rooms and I remember being the big sister going oh I don't have to deal with that but obviously as you get older you you know feel feel that feel that role don't you as a, as a role model but I can just see my little sister's face just going gross <laughs> I don't want to know <laughs> yeah. uh, this makes me laugh yeah it does. Dolly Doctor magazine Cosmic yep. Scene, yep. Dolly Doctor was a big one. I was a, a car chat person. So mum was one of those people that took advantage of a 20-minute car chat every Smart Tuesday woman. night, sometimes oversharing way too much. <laughs> Got to get that, that balance right, don't you? 
it is a very fine balance other than that just being given a book from an older cousin like here's a book about periods if you've got any questions ask and it was American and it was sort of like cartoon picture-ish and looking back and knowing what I know now and the work I do none of it felt real or relatable um, Mm -hmm. which really changes up I think having these discussions and reflecting on our own experiences allows us to to mix it up and then think what could have made that better and then hopefully make it better for those young people who we're working with uh sex ed class given to me by my brother-in-law as he was a teacher nice I bet that was well I hope it was nice not too too awkward the only talk I got came from school during sex ed Unfortunately, being religious, it focused more on female purity than anything. Yeah. Definitely a lot to unlearn. Your experience, Alison, is not, um, you're not alone in that. Mm-hmm. And in fact, when we talk to young people about the experiences in education that they have had at school, for a lot of people, it's not even applicable. Mm. If somebody has a diverse um, sexuality or gender identity, most of what they're getting is not applicable. Mm. It's not applicable to learn about pregnancy prevention if you're a gay identifying young man. It's Mm. just not. Um, Unfortunately, also in a lot of um, religious schools, like you said, around purity, but um, things like condom use and contraception may not be discussed. Um, Boys and girls were separated into two halls in year seven. The talk was sprung on us. We felt like we'd done something wrong. Mm. Uh, That's a really interesting Um, one. And these days where a lot in the past, it was like boys business, girls business, everybody be separated. Whilst we identify that within some cultures, it is very important to identify women's business and men's business. For the most part, we like to have everybody together and mm-hmm. share that educational experience. I think it's really important that each person understands what it is that their peers are going through as well. It's not just an issue or something for them Mm. and recognizing the non-binary folks that we have in our in our classes as well and and really which group do i go to it's just not yeah there is it yeah i forgot the name of the book that my mum got me but the illustrations were quite accurate which was good excellent as i mentioned before mum being a midwife there were no wrong questions i had the correct terms and they were always used such a beautiful positive experience joseph and Mm. speaks very much to the work that you're doing now and i don't think it's fate that you found yourself here (laughs) <laughs> my mum told me to keep my knees together. Great contraception talk, I roll. She's now 91 and able to talk about sexual health due to my job. So cute. So good. <laughs> so cute. Thank you for sharing those experiences, yeah. everyone. Like I said, the reason why we wanted to get you to do that was just to think about those experiences that you yourself had had and think about some of those possible cringe moments because we're going to touch on those again in a minute and to really take from your own experience and think about how you can shape it and make it a more meaningful, hopefully positive experience Mm. for the young people in your life. So moving on really nicely from that, what we're going to do now is jump back into another whiteboard activity with one question that you may not feel equipped to answer. So what's the one question that you've been a bit nervous about a young person coming forward to you and asking, or if you have an example of a question that a young person has asked you, which at the time you were just like, "Eh, I don't really know how to answer that. But what you did afterwards to be able to do that, we'd really love you to be able to share that with us. So again, you can go up into your view options, drop down to annotate, click on that text box up the top, and you can start writing onto that whiteboard for us. Great. Hopefully it's working for everybody. What's one question that you may not feel equipped to answer? It's those questions, isn't it, um, gnomes, where you're like, I hope I hope they don't ask me that question. Just please don't ask any question, but please don't ask any me that question. question. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Excellent. Okay, yep. So, oh, it's just disappeared, but someone had mainly if it's a direct question. So we talk about that normalising and globalising. So someone, and we've had this even in sessions when we've done it before, um, have you ever had sex or how old were you when you had sex? And you don't have to answer those questions personally if you choose not to. I mean, it obviously depends on the young person and how much you're wanting to share with them, but saying things like, 
at most points in people's life, they will become sexually active. That might be anywhere from, you know, 16 to 20, depending on their in a serious committed relationship or when they feel that the time is right for them. Just being able to globalise it or normalise it and not answer it personally can really help with avoiding those direct type questions. What if I'm asked about sex is like for me personally? Yes. So again, globalizing it and normalizing it. So, um, you know, sex is meant to be enjoyable. However, it may not be enjoyable for all people. It may certainly not be enjoyable the first time or even the second or third time. Um, globalizing and normalizing, not personalizing. Yeah. Concerned about getting language right around gender and sexual diversity. It's a big one. Um, we say to not be heteronormative. So if the young person says that they have a partner, don't just assume that the partner is of the opposite gender. So if you have um, a, a male young person, for example, don't just assume that their partner is female. Refer to that person as partner until they've confirmed um, the gender of that partner. Um, I guess some of the language too is around um, our transgendered young people and pronouns. Ask they will let you know what they would like to be referred as. And I think as long as we can show that we're really trying um, and we're making an effort, the young people truly appreciate that. So don't be afraid to get it wrong. Um, be afraid not to try, I guess is my best tip around that. I mostly work with parents, but questions around how to talk to their child about identifying partner abuse is hard. Yes. I see that that can be a very difficult conversation to have. And again, I think a lot of that comes down to that self-esteem and role modeling and being able to have those conversations about, you know, what is and isn't acceptable in relationships. And it can be really hard because for sometimes those young people have had that abuse role model to them and they don't know any different. Therefore, they think it is a loving, healthy relationship when other people seeing that know that indeed it's not. Mm. Um, how many times it was normal to masturbate I had to think on my feet for that one <laughs> okay mm. very interesting but also when it comes to masturbation it's um, a nice time to drop in here it's really important for us to talk to young women our uh, young identifying women about masturbation we don't see female masturbation in the media we don't see it in movies and tv shows in the same way that we see male masturbation it is, in fact, the safest, healthiest way that somebody can start to explore their sexual thoughts, feelings and behaviours. Um, it helps enormously when they do become sexually active in terms of knowing what does it for them and to be able to ask for what is pleasurable for them instead of having to endure a whole heap of unpleasurable, meaningless to them sex. Mm -hmm. I want to have sex with another boy, but I don't like the idea of anal sex. That's a really good one. So. Not all sex has to be penetrative either. So we can think about things there like out of play, out of course, mutual masturbation. There's oral sex as well. Other ways that we can get and give sexual pleasure without having to have penetrative sex. Uh -huh. uh, sorry, if... It is a question relating to something wrong with their genitals. I'm a health, oh, sorry, I'm not a health practitioner, so I have to refer them to get in touch with sexual health or doctor. Great. We're not always going to have the answers to these questions, but what it is important is that we know where to find those answers and that we feel comfortable referring. Um, what really stands out for me with that question, though, is why do they assume there is something wrong with their genitals? I want to park that idea because we're going to come to that in just a moment. A teenage boy once said he needed to ask me a question and sent his mother out of the room and then asked me. So that's about giving the person the space and place to ask those questions and to feel safe in asking them. Mm -hmm. Hope you've been able to touch on those. There's some really great questions. Is porn appropriate? We're coming right up to that. We're so you just on hold on tight. <laughs> All right, I'll get back to the slides. Whiteboard, whiteboard's working pretty well. It would, is. I'm I impressed. Yeah. I'm impressed. Yeah. Thanks, Joseph, for your contribution in the chat as well on the anal sex one. Thank you for contributing right. that. I think I kind of, yeah, hit on that. We were thinking alike. Yeah. 
Okay, so I got asked a question I don't know how to answer. This is that cringe moment, some of those questions that you've brought up. Oh, sorry, was referring to if they have any symptoms in their genitals. Right. Yeah, go get a sexual health checkup or speak to a doctor if there's any signs or symptoms is always our advice. So first and foremost, when a young person comes to us with a question that either might be direct, like some of you have mentioned, might seem quite personal or it might feel a little bit tricky, sometimes they're testing the waters with us. How much is there that you're willing to disclose? How much of it do you feel comfortable with? So they might ask a really tricky direct question just to see what your reaction is. On the inside, you can be screaming and cringing, but on the outside, you need to be coming across as cool, calm, collected, you haven't shocked me. It's getting rid of that shock factor that young people often throw away. One of the things that I like to do is acknowledge the young person and the relationship that they have with you. So thanks for asking me that question. Thanks for trusting me with that. We don't need to know all the answers. So it's okay for us to say, great question. I actually don't know what the answer to that is, but how about we find out together? Finding out together can be things like Nurse Nettie on PlaySafe. It's a nurse, it's a sexual health nurse. You can drop her an email and you'll get a reply within one to two working days. You can call up the sexual health info line and all of these resources will be sent through in the follow-up email that Jen will send after today's session. So you can call up the sexual health info line and ask the question together. You can put it on loudspeaker and that's achieving two things. You're both finding out the information at the same time, but you're also role modeling to that young person how easy it is to find out that information for themselves if and when it comes to it. So really checking in with them. Also don't um, assume what they do or don't already know. So one of the things I like to do is tell me what you already know about that. In asking that back to them, you're able to gauge where they're coming from, how much they know or what it is that they've heard. Because if we're talking about a young person who's heard information potentially in the playground or from their peers, they may not have the correct information. So it's a chance for us to be able to say, oh, that's great. It's great that you've been able to have that conversation with somebody or you think that's what it is. But in fact, this is what it is, or this is what you should know about that. In being able to have those conversations, we think, why are we having this conversation in the first place? Why am I wanting that young person to come to me and ask these questions? And we need to think about what is our reasoning behind it in the first place? And that is that we want to increase the personal safety of our young people. We want them to understand boundaries. We're trying to increase that self-esteem and confidence, and we want it to lead to improved health outcomes and better decision-making for them. So if that's always at the back of our minds, we're just thinking positive reasons, getting this information across, what do I want our young people to achieve from this? Improve confidence, improve health, and better outcomes and decision making. Try to normalize the conversation. Uh, like I said, that helps when you have those direct questions in particular. Normalize it, globalize it, don't personalize it. One of the things that I touched on before was the reality versus perception. And we see this a lot with young people. They might come to us and say, but everybody's having sex. And we say, who's everybody and what do they mean by sex? We know based on a secondary school survey, it's only 25% of young people in year 10 who are engaged in sex or sexual behaviours and 50% by the time they get to year 12. In year 12, they're all above the legal age of sexual consent, which is 16, but there's still 50% of people who are choosing not to partake in sexual acts or behaviours. They may talk amongst their peers as though they are involved in sexual acts because it's that sense of self-esteem and wanting to fit in. So the reality of what's happening versus the perception that young people have of themselves or that we have as the parents and carers are actually two very different things. The other thing I'm going to get across with the questions and what some young people may be going through and experiencing is that for us, where there's maybe one, potentially two generations different to the young people today, things are different. It isn't the same as how it was even just five or 10 years ago. So just because they're coming to us with these things, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's just different. And the other thing that we like to say a lot in this job is don't yuck somebody's yum. 
So just because a young person might be into anal sex or oral sex, and that wasn't your thing when you were younger, it doesn't mean that we're like, ew, gross, why are you doing that? Don't do it. It's celebrating that we're all different. We're going to get our kicks out of different things. And if that's what does it for them, we encourage them to do it safely and get regular sexual health checkups. There's nothing wrong with their behaviours. We just think about that harm minimization and how we make it safer for them. So I hope that helps with answering some of those tricky questions. Just remember, there's lots of places that you can turn to. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to know the answer, but refer and find out together. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks, Gnomes. I think, you know, we've mentioned already some of those those hot topics. So we might um, dive into that just looking at the time. We've got about 15 minutes to yep. go um, through these hot topics. There's lots of common common questions that we get asked and, and one of the big ones is consent and there's no denying that consent um, has been a recently highlighted topic in a lot of media at the, at the moment um, and probably a conversation that's been happening at work and at home. We've been talking about consent for a long time um, at Caddy Shack and, and you might have talked about consent for a long time as well and it's really about, you know, would you say Gnomes taking advantage of that current awareness and the current hype about consent and really getting those consistent and accurate messages across. So when it comes to um, talking about consent, how do we talk about it and how do we bring it up in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. Is anyone still feeling a bit ill from that off milkshake that we had a couple of months ago? If you don't know, you don't know. But if you don't know and you want to know, <laughs> go check out the, if you just Google milkshake consent ad, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And yeah. it was some media that we had recently. And, you know, they always say any media is good media. It brought up the conversation around consent for That's all the wrong reasons, but it did give us a platform to leverage off in talking about this. A couple of things. There's a fantastic book out called Welcome to Consent by Dr. Melissa Kang and Yumi Stein. It's about $12 from Kmart or your local book agency or buy online. Fantastic resource, age appropriate from um, sort of, you know, tweens right through to 20s. I think the trouble with consent is that it's not role modelled well within society. We don't see it being role modelled well in TV shows and movies and therefore young people often don't have a reference to how to consent when it comes to sex. Just quickly, sexual consent in New South Wales is 16 and over, um, regardless of if you're male or female or regardless of who your sexual partner is. Um, we talk about those teachable moments and for a long time we've spoken about no means no when it comes to consent. And indeed, if somebody says no, they mean no. However, there's a lot of ways that um, somebody can say no or mean no without actually saying it. So things like tone, those nonverbal body language mm -hmm. um, cues that they might be giving off. So instead, we're more moving to a yes is yes and trying to educate young people on questions that they can ask to get a yes from their partner in those sexual situations so that they know um, that they're getting consent. So do you feel safe? Do you feel comfortable? Are you wanting to continue? If you're getting a yes and it's an enthusiastic yes, you can be assured that you're getting that consent. In terms of a teachable moment, there's a reason why there was the bucket of fries up there on um, that slide. Next time you're with your young person having takeaway and you're eating chips, I want you to take it as a teachable moment. And we talk about fries when it comes to consent. So that is F, is that consent is freely given. You should never feel forced, pressured or coerced into having sex with somebody. R, that it's reversible. So even if you have said yes to a particular sexual act, you might then start getting in the moment and think, mm, this doesn't feel right. Your body's starting to send off some of those signs like nervous in the tummy, feeling a bit sick, going, yeah, this isn't for me. You can reverse it at any time and take that consent back and the other party has to adhere to that. That consent is informed, so we know exactly what it is that we're consenting to. It may be that I've consented to oral sex, but just because I've consented to oral sex doesn't mean that I've con like consented to full-blown penetrative sex. It needs to be enthusiastic, so it needs to be like a heck yes, there's nowhere else I'd rather be with you right now than in this moment about to do this act, as opposed to just a like, that's not convincing to anybody. 
Also that it's specific. Um, so yeah, I give consent for anal sex or I give consent for vaginal sex or I don't give consent for oral, whatever the case may be. I think what's difficult for young people to navigate is like I said, it's not role model to them very well. And it's not like giving consent for anything else where we literally sign a piece of paper and we say, yes, we agree to all the terms and conditions. It's very different. So it's really important that it comes down um, to that communication and letting young people know that it is black and white, it is a yes and no, but what can make it very grey is, for example, the use of drugs and alcohol and what does that mean? The law it says that under the influence of drugs or alcohol, we can't give consent. So having those conversations and, again, we'll send through resources such as the T consent video on YouTube that can really help break that down for you and to educate further. And I mean, maybe you, using the word consent um, in everyday conversation, would you say, right, you know, we're talking about sexual consent right now, but consent is, is across the board that you consent to everything every day. Yeah, absolutely. So really you, utilising that word so it's not such a scary, mm -hmm. scary word that's just about, you know, sexual assault, which I think the media just kind of throw that out there and that's all we see. Absolutely. Again, uh -huh. normalising those conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Moving right along to pornography, um, such a hot topic and often um, an area of discussion brought up by parents and carers, um, mm -hmm. perhaps maybe due to its ease of accessibility online, um, lots of other issues that come up around porn. But what should we be concerned about when we talk about porn and how do we have that conversation about the difference between porn sex and real sex? Yeah, really good question. And my throwback is if you're not talking about porn with them, then who is? Because somebody is. So just a generation ago, we had to go in search of porn. It was actually really difficult to access. It was trying to find someone who was over 18 that was able to go and purchase that black market material and then, you know, hide it in a plastic bag under a bunch of leaves in the local cubby house so that everybody could have a look. But these days, porn finds us. So what I mean by that is that we've got 12 year olds now who have been exposed to porn, mostly through video gaming and ads that will pop up on those channels. So it is a lot more accessible than it was just a generation ago. Thank you very much, mm. internet. Um, soft porn is quite often seen as an educational tool and it certainly does have a place. But like you said, Maddie, what's really important for young people to recognise is that what they're seeing in porn doesn't equate to what happens in real life. The best tool and resource that we have found around this and we'll send through is a YouTube clip called Porn Sex Versus Real Sex. It uses food, so it's very, you know, PG rated. But when we're watching porn, we're not often seeing things like sexual consent. We're not seeing things like condom use. We might be seeing um, acts, sexual acts, which are quite explicit and that not all people would necessarily be into. So soft porn and the viewing of it in terms of an educational experimentational phase can be quite healthy. What can happen though is it can move into the viewing of harder core porn and it can become addictive. So people can become addicted to the context um, as well as the content that is um, being displayed in porn. So the thing is that we're having a conversation, we're letting young people know that it's okay for an entertainment purpose, but in terms of having it provided as a full-blown sexual education, sexual health experience, it's not necessarily the best conversation. Um, and that watching that clip, for example, real sex versus porn sex can show how reality and perception are two very different things. There's also a great resource from our friends across the ditch in New Zealand called Keeping It Safe Online, and it shows that online interaction and um, porn and how we can have those conversations with young people and what we need to be thinking about when it comes to that as well. So I guess the viewing of pornographic material, it really is a rite of passage. I think that a lot of young people sort of see that as a rite of passage and some of that experimentation and first sort of insights into the world of sex. And there's something quite, um, oh, what's the word? Like, you know, not devious, but it's like, oh, like I'm entitled to that now and I want to be able to access that. And very much a sense of not wanting to miss out on what peers are potentially tuning into as well. So 
My question is, if you're not discussing it, who is? Because you can guarantee that your young people are hearing about and seeing porn. Mm. Yeah, just before we move on to the the next hot topic, which um, Joseph has already kicked us off in the chat box, there is a question I've just scrolled up a little bit in the chat box, sorry that I missed it, um, just about can you please remind us what globalising means, the, the sure. term globalising, yeah. Yeah, so like I said, instead of personalising it, so normalising is like that this is okay, globalising is making it bigger than just you or the other person. So using terms like most people at some yeah. point in their life. So in saying most, we're globalising it, we're making it bigger than just ourselves and the other person. I hope that yeah. makes sense. I think that might have been in relation to when we were talking about if, you get asked a specific yes. question personally. Yeah, I think so. The yes. response is globalising. Yeah, so moving on to our um, final hot topic, sexting. I'll, um, I'll... It's a good one. Right it's, your a, way. it's a good one. And look, it's indeed probably the one that parents and carers are most concerned about, to be honest. And yeah. what I need to say on this is it's not just young people that are sexting. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term sexting, it's the sending or receiving of explicit messaging or images. And as I said, it's not just young people who are doing this, but sadly, there are greater repercussions for young people mm -hmm. engaging in sexting. So when we talk to young people about this, it's really letting them know about the legalities, but without going all like I told you on them. Um, the trouble is if somebody takes, it's considered making. So even if I've taken a nude image of myself under the age of 18, I could be considered to be making child pornography. So it's the taking of it, it's the sending of it, it's the receiving of it, and it's the storing of it. So if police happen to come across a young person's phone and there were those sexually explicit images on there, they can find themselves in quite hot water if that other person is under 18 because it is considered child pornography. Um, that becomes problematic if they are indeed charged with an offence because they will then go onto the sex offenders register and that can have massive implications for them later on in life in terms of career choice and things like that. So I guess one of the things that we talk to young people about is how we manage or mitigate some of the risk involved in sexting. Often when those images are taken, they're taken in good nature and they're sent in good nature. However, a lot of young people's relationships don't tend to last too long and sometimes as a form of revenge, um, there is a term called revenge porn where you may have sent that image to one person but that one person now shares it with 100 other people and once you've sent that message or that image, it's out of your control. So it's the same with social media content. Once you've posted, it's no longer yours. Somebody else owns that and it's out of your control. When it comes to the image, I like to say things like not putting your face in the image and not putting any identifiable features like birthmarks, tattoos, piercings, etc. Another really good filter to run it past is if you wouldn't show your nan, don't send it or don't put it online. But it does, uh, sexting is kind of a, a little fine line between having self-esteem, which is what we want our young people to have, versus then having that self-esteem to take that image and feel confident in sharing it, having that self-love, that's what we want. But then the flip side of that is I've shared that image in good faith, but now everybody else has seen it, the self-esteem impacts that that can have a huge, and we know of situations where young people have had to leave their school because there wasn't a single person that didn't see their naked image mm. that was shared around. So sexting can be really difficult. Um, as Joseph has said, apps and messaging services like Snapchat these days, things that flash up and then, um, you know, disappear. Mm. I believe there is a way that you can save that content now. I'm not a Snapchatter person. I have not the faintest idea how it works, but just think about those filters and run it through those yeah. filters. Would you show your name? And if not, don't put it out there. And if you are going to put it out there, mm. be be safer and smarter about it. Yeah. yeah. And the resources too, just um, mentioning Office of e of eSafety as well as um, services like New Street. Yes. Um, you want to, yeah. Make, yeah. Make, so New Street that. help with um, what is terms like problematic sexualized behavior, but um, we will send out those links as part of the follow-up as well because they're all great resources. 
So I'm going to take us back to our final uh, topic, which is really wrapping up everything that we've talked about. We've talked about sexuality, owning your sexuality. How does sex positive come into it? What does it even mean? Um, and how does it link into having informed and safe choices around sex and sexual health? Naomi, and, and I just want to also recognize that we're, we've got about five minutes left of the session. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can safely say that we're going to go over time. So please feel free to jump out if you need to run off to another um, meeting or if you've got something else on at 1130. But I don't want to cut us off. I think, you know, this conversation of sex positivity is a really important one. And then lastly, we're just going to give some resources. So if you do need to leave, feel free to do that. You will get the recording. You can catch up. But I don't want to cut you off, Gnomes. I'll let, I'll let you go <laughs> talking awesome. about sex positivity. Mm. So when we talk about sex positivity, the first thing that's really important to acknowledge is that unfortunately not everybody's experience of sex is positive. And we very much acknowledge that. What we do acknowledge, though, is that sex um, and positive sexual experiences, meaningful, pleasurable, enjoyable sexual experiences, they are a human right. So if somebody has had a, a negative sexual experience, we really do encourage them to, to reach out, to speak out and to get professional counselling and help to then be able to move past that and uh, enjoy those sexual experiences that they are entitled to. Being sex positive is mostly about language and that sex is something that should be enjoyed. It is a right. It is, um, it's about encouraging people to recognise that sex is part of our holistic health. Um, it should be addressed the same way that we address mental health or drug and alcohol. In the same ways that we would go to the doctor when we felt sick with a cold or flu, we would go to a doctor if we um, had regular sexual partners and had had any unprotected or condomless sex, or if we had any signs or symptoms in our genital areas that we were concerned about. How do we be sex positive towards young people? How do we encourage sex positivity in them? It's about education and empowerment. If we provide them with the education, the skills, the tools and the resources, they will then go on to hopefully have those meaningful experiences. When we're raising and educating young people around sexual health and relationships, we're not encouraging them to rush out and to have those experiences. In fact, we know from research that young people who have had meaningful discussions around sexual health and relationships are actually delaying um, that first instance of um, sexual act or behaviour and that when they do engage in those acts, they are often using protection and they're knowing about sexual health screening and getting those follow-ups. Really, as I said, it's about seeing it holistically. Sex is not something to be ashamed of and we shouldn't be shaming anybody for their sexual preferences or their sexual acts or their sexual identity. It's not something that we should be out there judging. It's something that should be enjoyed. And if we take off that judgment lens and we put on the safety hat instead, it's about, you know, I don't necessarily mind what you're doing or who you're doing it with. I just want to make sure that you're doing it in the safest way possible for you and other people sex and sex positivity like I said it is a right it's a human right and it is about having those meaningful and fulfilling sexual um, experiences and that's one of the questions that um, you know young people will often say to us is how do I know if it's the right time to have sex and what I will often say is when it feels right for you and it's going to be a mutually beneficiating arrangement so it's not just about you say performing oral sex on somebody it's having that return so that you're both having that pleasure that's when it will be right for you when it is something that you're going to receive in return and that it is consenting and that it is what you are wanting so sex positivity really helps us to develop that language with young people mm. yeah thanks thanks gnomes and i think it's really important after um hearing all of these fundamentals of sexual health and the, and the hot topics to really finish talking about sex positivity i think it really brings it brings it all together and yeah. just with our last few moments that we have um for those who are happy to to stick on i think it's really important that we check back in so i might open open up our um whiteboard gnomes and you can have a little look at and see if we've if we've covered everything 
Cool. So updating skills yeah. and knowledge, that's going to be different for everybody, depending on where your skill and knowledge set was already at. Hopefully you've been able to take something away from today's session. Yeah. Um, if not directly from us, from the links that we'll, we'll share by email after this session. And as I mentioned before, we're always happy to take your calls and emails to answer any specific questions or address anything in further detail if we haven't covered off on it today. Um, love talking about foof and wangers all the time. So this is perfect for me. When we work in this field, there's not too many conversations that we can have without having a lot of pun thrown in there. So um, yeah, let's keep talking about it, but let's talk about penises and vaginas instead of foofs yes. and wangers. Yeah. Um, wanting to hear how other people are having the conversations. I hope you've been able to take some tips and tricks away um, from today. Definitely check out the resource. Um, there's lots of other tips and tricks in there. I don't think we had, um, well, I don't know. We maybe did have quite a few people on here today with their parenting um, hat on, but I know a lot of us are working in a professional capacity with young people too. So those conversations may look a little bit different um, just in terms of privacy, confidentiality, mandatory reporting, mm -hmm. et cetera. But um, yeah, really take those teachable moments that we've touched on today and think about the referencing of young people and what's um, current for them and being able to leverage off that. Hopefully, um, yeah, you'll get some resources out of it, um, increase skills, knowledge. I hope your curiosity was um, sparked and that our yeah. um, session that came highly recommended um, lived up to your expectation that you had today. So from Maddie and I, thank you so much to everyone who joined us this morning. It yeah. really does mean a lot. Um, we will pop up some resources. These are just additional things that I've um, mentioned throughout today's session and links to all of these resources will be sent to you in the follow-up email, as well as a really quick survey that we'd love you to complete if you can. So just to wrap us up and say thank you, goodbye. We have a powerful potential in our youth and we must have the courage to change old ideas and practices so that we may direct their power toward good ends. So power to the people really you know respect to young people and we have as much to learn from them as they have to learn Absolutely. from us 